So welcome everyone to lecture number 10. We are going to continue our discussion on the deformation at the micro scale. And um, we'll touch uh, upon these topics that you see uh, listed here. And then we'll start discussing about folds and the folding, the process of folding, a uh, big topic in geology. But finally, uh, we, we get to, to finish today our discussion about these processes. Um, we discussed last time about the um, brittle mechanisms, and we dis started discussing last time about the plastic deformation mechanisms. And if you remember, we discussed about diffusion, like three types of diffusion, uh, something that we call volume, um, another one called grain boundary and one which is pressure solution or wet diffusion and also we discussed about twinning so uh, you see there, there is this category of crystal plasticity um, so there is deformation in the crystal but uh, the crystal doesn't break uh, and the last the uh, what we, I left for today was something called dislocation creep, which is kind of <laughs> fancy, uh, might seem a bit weird to you. Uh, I'll show you what it is about. Um, so let's let's look at this uh, as a different mechanism. So you remember we had this diagram or map with different fields uh, as to where you would have various uh, plastic deformation mechanisms depending on the temperature and differential stress. Um, so these are the plastic deformation. Now here, fracture and cataclysis, you see low temperature. Yeah, so it, it's at the surface of the crust uh, the, in the upper part of the crust, low temperature, and you need a certain differential stress, yeah, a high differential stress to break the rocks. Um, so now we discuss about this field, yeah, called dislocation creep. And I'll I'll explain to you uh, what it is. Uh, when you studied mineralogy, or maybe you are doing now mineralogy with Marcos, <laughs> with my colleague Marcos, uh, I don't know how much time he has to talk about uh, a field of study called crystallography, because you learn about minerals there crystallographic system and so on. But there is in some universities where you take classes and you may have to take a, a course called crystallography. Now, so we, we, we go down to the crystal lattice, to the distribution of the atoms yeah, in the crystal lattice and so on. We don't get into many details now, but just to, to, to look a bit at the text here. So as an idea, when we say dislocation, that means that we have a line defect, yeah, a line defect. So imagine this is a line defect here in a crystal and it's mobile, yeah? So what happens is this line defect moves in response to differential stress, moves through the crystal and, and the crystal in the end gets deformed. I'll show you how. Uh, but the idea is that this movement is called sleep, sleep, yeah? So so as you can say here, it says sleep implies movement of a dislocation front within a sleep plane. So the, geometrically speaking, I'll show you what the dislocation line uh, looks like. But here, imagine that this plane, this half plane here, moves from this part to this part of the crystal. Yeah, that's the idea. Now, the whole thing is that there is no breakage in the in the crystal. So the crystal break yeah it's just that the actual deformation happens uh in a small volume at a time yeah so in the end the crystal stays together yeah so we don't talk about the brittle mechanism it's a plastic uh, mechanism um so you see here like a definition yeah when we talk about dislocation creep we talk about formation movement and destruction yeah so disappearance of these dislocations in a crystal. So let's let's look at, at these locations first. 
so if you were to play a game, you can imagine this initially was a very nice um, regular uh, crystal lattice with the atoms yeah, in these nodes. The defect here, which is called edge dislocation, what you can see here in the regularity of, here, of this is that you have a half plane in the middle here, but it doesn't continue here. So as you can see, the crystal is kind of deformed here. Yeah, you, you can see this. It's this extra half plane, if you want. Yeah, it looks to us. So this is called an edge dislocation. Yeah, which is the edge of an extra half plane in the crystal lattice. Yeah, so that's that's the idea. And the slip direction goes like from here to here or from here to here. So that's why it says this half uh plane uh, you see it's perpendicular to its slip direction so the slip direction is like this i'll show you how it moves there is another type of dislocation and this is even fancier uh to imagine and you can see it here so initially you can imagine this atom was linked to this atom and everything was perfect but there was kind of the that's why it's called screw yeah screw because it like from the screw yeah there is a bit of rotation here if you imagine this now let's look at the edge dislocation we won't go into all the details it's just for you to get an idea yeah and i get an idea of this dislocation creep so if people look with the electron microscope to to them these dislocations look like this yeah so these are dislocations you see there is something that breaks the normal structure of the of the crystal and here you can see these are the dislocations and then several of these dislocation uh, planes they get together and they form a dislocation wall we'll talk in a bit about this and these dislocation walls break or separate the the initial crystal into two subgrains so here you see a subgrain boundary there is a wall and you have two subgrains yeah that's the idea um so let's let's look at this cartoon yeah at this cartoon so initially you have this very nice and happy crystal nothing bothers him and suddenly you have some stress imposed on it yeah so that's the idea of differential stress so you can imagine the stress yeah impinges here on the crystal lattice and what happens it forces kind of this part yeah, of this uh, initial plane, half of it to kind of suddenly slip. So it slips, this atom will connect to this atom. Yeah, you, you can see. And then this atom will remain suspended here in, in the air, you see it here. So by doing this, this is what happened. Yeah, but the stress continues. So then this, uh, atom will actually li will link with the next atom and this whole thing will get translated you see it here and then it will get translated more yeah and basically the uh, if it ma manages to get to the edge of the crystal yeah at the edge the dislocation is basically destroyed so uh, actually you see how the crystal was deformed without breaking yeah so that's the idea that's why you call this plastic defor deformation yeah but at a very very small scale you can read the text here it explains this this is from a different textbook yeah but in the Fawson textbook that you have they show the same thing but now they show it from the left to right yeah so i've shown you from right to left this is left to right and you can see now they show it in 2d not in 3d but you can see how basically this will connect here and this will stay suspended here. Yeah, you see it here. And then so it gets basically, as you can see, it gets translated. <laughs> and by getting translated, you see how the crystal is deformed at the end. Yeah. So that's something that this slip is also called dislocation glide. Glide or slip, yeah, it's the same. Now, in addition to glide, so glide or slip is what I've shown you until now. There is another process called climb. So as you can see, as you can see, 
what you have here, you have, let's say, an atom that jumps here. Yeah, you see, atom jumps into half plane here. Yeah. And here you have a vacancy. So basically, as you can see, the extra half plane here got extended. All right. So this is called climb. So actually, the plane, this, this location moves like this, but can get extended or shortened. Now, if it were to get shortened, you see what happens. This atom jumps into this vacancy and this gets shortened. Because we discussed there are also vacancies in the crystals. They are not perfect. Yeah. You've seen last time. So you have these two situations, glide and climb up and down. Com if you combine, does matter. If you combine, this is what is called dislocation creep. Yeah. So this is the thing, dislocation creep. This is the combined activity. So I think I just wanted to give you, uh, you know, kind of this understanding that in, in the crystal, we have this kind of movements and this is a plasticity of the crystal yeah um now i i've shown you this now let's come back to something that we discussed really early in the in the class and then we had the test you remember we were discussing about the uh rheologic profile you remember rheology of the crust and lithosphere and we discussed the brittle, uh, the brittle criterion, and I, I've shown you the, when rocks uh, have, you know, brittle strength, and uh, their deformation is by brittle mechanisms. There is the Biarritz law. You see this straight line here. But at some point, I, at that time, I've shown you there is what we call the plastic flow law. Plastic flow law. Yeah. So, and I, 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 I've shown you a function like this. Now here, I just, you know, kind of, we got to the point because we discussed about plasticity. We discussed about all these plastic mechanisms to have a look at what the description of this function is, yeah? So you see some examples of descriptions. You don't have to memorize these things, but for instance, this location glide, which is what we just discussed, yeah, this location glide is it's this thing. Yeah, this one can be described by this by this law. Yeah, which links the strain rate. Yeah, the strain rate to the differential stress. That that's what it is. So, for instance, if the mechanism is this location glide, you can use such a relationship to know what the law is. If, if, uh, for instance, if it says, if the dislocation creep dominates, yeah, then the law becomes here. You see, it is a power law creep. So here it's n is e equal one. So this is a particular case of this one. Just for you to have an idea, yeah, why this is different from this. This is the equation of a line. So here we have, as you can see, as a, an exponential. Um, function. Now, um, if the the flow, the plastic flow, is by diffusion, like mechanisms that we discussed uh, last time, uh, the expression looks like this. For instance, yeah. So, just for you again to have an idea, you don't have to to memorize them. Yeah, just to to uh, complete this part of information that you had to see that without knowing why so the, basically this mathematics describes the processes the physical processes that we just discussed last time and this time yeah uh, the beginning of this class all right now let's finish the story of this deformation at micro scale with something that uh, <laughs> that um, uh, you know it's like the second part of the story what happens is that when you see these uh, crystals yeah being deformed yeah they acquire strain energy yeah so strain energy because they get strained and in general 
things in nature aspire, yeah, the processes aspire to states of lower energy in general. This is a general observation in nature, yeah? So we go from higher energy to lower energy. So the idea is that the crystals are not very happy. They, they have strain energy and they wanna get a, to a lower energetic state. So these are the processes of recovery and the recrystallization. So in the end, the deformation of these crystals leads to something called the recovery and I'll show you what it is. And in the end, if it's taken to the end, it leads to recrystallization, which means new crystals are formed, yeah, which are kind of, they don't have these things that they don't like, these dislocations, yeah. So the idea is that uh, as the dislocation travels and tries, the, the crystal tries to get the dislocation at the margin, yeah, because the crystal wants to have a different situation, energetically speaking. It doesn't like the strain, yeah, uh, uh, due to this dislocation. Now, what this text tries to say is that when we discussed about these processes, yeah, what happens with the dislocation and so on, this is really, really small at the atomic scale, and people use electronic microscopes, yeah, for this type of mag magnification. We cannot see them with the typical optical microscopes that you use in the mineralogy course. But the final part of the story, like the recovery and recrystallization, they, the, the effects of this can be seen with an optical microscope. So they are microstructures. As a result of this plastic deformation, this microstructures are being formed and you can see them or their effects you can see with an optical microscope this is what this text tells you here and it's explained in the textbook as well so let's see what they mean recovery recovery you see it has a definition which i think it's pretty good it says that these are the processes that move or cancel out or order the dislocations so as I said, the crystal tries to get rid of the dislocation, yeah? So imagine that you have many and they migrate. And by migrating at some point, they get accumulated into a wall. And this is like what you see, a dislocation wall. So the, the idea is the crystal wants to put some order in it, yeah? So it says, okay, we'll have a place well, there are these things that we don't like, and we'll keep them there in this wall. And the rest of the crystal is happy, yeah? So the crystal is happy here, and it's happy here. But somewhere in the middle, he created a, a wall. That's uh, the basura, yeah? So it, it puts the, the, these, <laughs> these locations. So by doing this, and you've seen with the uh, electron microscope, you, you've seen they look they look like some lines. Those are the walls, yeah? The dislocations that moved into, into the walls. So by doing this, imagine this was initially a bigger crystal. Now the crystal is segmented, yeah? Into two parts, yeah? So we can call these two parts subgrains. One subgrain and another subgrain here, yeah? So... What happens because of this wall, the two subgrains are kind of pushed one uh, from the other, and there is an angle between them. And you see, usually it's less than five degrees. Now, what happens, you, if you took the mineralogy class uh, and the mineralogy laboratory course, and if you had the chance, now the problem is if you did it in the past, you could come on campus, look at the microscope. Now, I don't know what my colleagues do with the laboratories because the laboratories being virtual, they have to show you pictures. But the idea is that when you look, for instance, uh, you look with the microscope in polar, uh, cross polarized light and you look at quartz crystals, you'll see that some quartz crystals have some undulations, yeah? It's not like, one quartz crystal, it's only one color. It has 
part of it it's lighter part of it it's darker so it it seems that there is something about it those are the subgrains yeah those are these domains separated by these dislocation walls yeah so when you look in the microscope you will see these undulations you see here it's a certain uh, shade and here another shade and here there is another shade and so on so this is your undulation that you can see in some some of these crystals yeah here are the same this is the microstructure this is why we can see with the optical microscope the effect of this process that we call recovery all right so recovery the crystal tries to recover itself to 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 get to a as better a shape as possible okay now beyond the recovery there is recrystallization so recrystallization yeah means the strained grains eventually get replaced by unstrained grains so there is a recrystallization so that they get rid of the dislocations yeah so so um the idea is that um you can have this recrystallization happening during the deformation so there are competing processes imagine the differential stress it deforms it forces the crystals to deform and at the same time the crystal deforms and then it tries to recover and recry recrystallize so basically two competing processes so recrystallization basically is the state where the crystals have a lower energy yeah have a lower energy in response to the stress and if this happens during this uh, period where you have this uh, differential stress acting we call it dynamic recrystallization because it's during that time now if the deformation happened yeah during a certain geological period and then it stopped and recrystallization happened afterwards the crystals try to recrystallize it's called static recrystallization or annealing yeah static recrystallization so the idea is uh you have this competition i, I tried to explain to you between the formation and recovery and recrystallization yeah and recrystallization this is i'm gonna finish here with this uh part of the um, micro scale just for you to have an idea so you have two subgrains yeah five degrees so if this rotated by five degree by less than 10 degrees we call it subgrain and it's conventional if the rotation due to a due to a wall of these locations is more than 10 degrees then it is considered that we get two new crystals yeah so the rotation of these subgrains yeah leads to new crystals and the other process is something called migration of grain boundaries yeah or a process called grain boundary migration or migration or recrystallization now here what happens is strained grain unstrained grain. and what happens is the crystal here is not happy has this strain energy so if you have like a, a nucleation here a zone some of the atoms from these crystals from this lattice will jump to this lattice because they want to be in a perfect lattice they want to be in a good crystal so they will jump and by doing this this crystal actually grows here yeah so you see it bulges here so this is another uh, process of uh, recrystallization through the migration of the boundary yeah so um the idea is that in the end you'll, you'll see some pictures in the textbook you in the deformed rocks in the zones with plastic deformation you can recognize recrystallized uh minerals yeah as a result of the formation of all this that we discussed all right so this is it for the formation micro scale i know it is very new and probably weird to you and so on but it's good for you to have an idea to to reference and i am pretty sure that 
all of you now have a good understanding of the difference between brittle and plastic, yeah, and why ductile is such a confusing term, yeah, but it is used, but it is confusing because it is just what our eyes see without knowing what happens uh, at the micro scale, yeah. So I think that now you have enough information for you to 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 understand this. All right, so uh, enough with this pain. <laughs> Please uh, read chapter 10, uh, a few pages here. They have uh, diagrams and uh, pictures, so it's not that much text. Don't get scared. Um, and what we'll do, we'll start discussing about folds and we'll discuss about folds for the rest of our time here and uh, next time, yeah? So, in the same manner that we discussed about faults, like fajas, yeah, which are very important in geology, faults are also very uh, important. I think they are pliegas. So, uh, in English, you see fault and fold, kind of, they sound almost similar. So, uh, you have to have a very good diction to make it clear what you are talking about. Um, but many people argue, uh, and I think uh, that this statement here, that faults are visually the most spectacular or, of earth structures. Of course, some people might say other things are very spectacular, so on, which I agree, but at least they are among the most spectacular they can be, yeah, which is uh, um, kind of true, especially when we look at a, a scale which inspires us, yeah? And if you look, I wanted to put this picture here because here is a, a person. So you see the scale here, yeah? So this is spectacular. And I think this is a very beautiful rock because uh, you, what you have here, uh, you have gneiss, you have gneiss that was folded, but the gneiss was bended. Uh, so bended gneiss had different like layers of mafic and felsic minerals. Now, these layers are not like the sedimentary layers in the rocks, because in the gneiss, the gneiss is a metamorphic rock. So it's a, it's a rock that was formed under uh, intense pressure and temperature. So the pre-existing rock was completely transformed into this rock. Yeah, so it's a metamorphic rock uh, as a result of intense metamorphism. And during this process of metamorphism, yeah, what happens is that you get a separation also through plastic, through plastic processes of flow, a separation of the mafic and felsic minerals, and they look as if you have layers, but they are not sedimentary layers, yeah? It's just the result of metamorphism. And in this outcrop, if we had such an outcrop, we could spend uh, a few days examining it because it's quite impressive. And if you read this, if you read this um, uh, legend, yeah, not now. When you read it, I, you know, I urge you to do it. Not to. Uh, there is nothing for you to to torture you. It's for you to see what a typical, very technical text in geology sounds like yeah so that you are you will understand why i insist so much that you understand the concepts and the terminology and all these things so that you can read these things yeah uh, and when you read this you'll 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 read about folds and it says upright yeah so upright here and it says folded boudins what are these well are these things you see the black things is it says fb fb you see the dark things these are mafic minerals yeah mafic minerals and this is a more competent a more competent you remember uh, the concept of competence a more competent layer yeah of mafic or region of mafic minerals uh in the gneiss so basically it got through the folding it got flattened and extended and it kind of broke into pieces and you see the pieces so these are called boudins yeah so up to here 
we talk about structural geology. Yeah, and this is what we are learning now, structural geology. But then it says something very interesting, resulting from continental collision of East and West Gondwana. Now we are talking about tectonics. Yeah, when you talk about continental collision. So we learn to read the rocks so that we can understand the history of the uh, of the crust and of what happened with it. So that's why we have to go slowly through these things and some are boring, I know, to, to be able to have a beautiful perspective. It, it is, you know, structural geology and tectonics, in my opinion, it is the same way like climbing a mountain. You put a lot of effort and climb and climb and climb. And when you get to the top and you understand them, you get a beautiful view. Yeah, that's the idea. So that's why we are doing this, uh, these uh, uh, lectures. So you can read this just for you to, to see how the terminology is used. Yeah, and why we need to, to, uh, to learn it. All right, so um, being, uh, you know, a tectonicist, you have to understand many, many aspects of geology. It is, uh, it is like a very good doctor, yeah, who, who knows a lot of medicine to understand the complexity taken internist, yeah, an internist. He, an internist has to understand so much in medicine to be able to understand the physiology so well and to diagnose any problem, yeah? So it's more or less the same with, you know, tectonicists. Now let's have a look at this one. So, uh, oh, that one, the, the previous one is from Antarctica. Yeah, so uh, quite cool. This one is from Tibet, you see in China. What we are looking at here is a, a sink line. So the, you see this big fold, yeah? And you see the different layers. Now these are sedimentary layers, yeah? These are sedimentary layers. Uh, and what uh, the uh, authors here say, they, they say that you should have a look at uh, the scale of this thing. This is a village here, yeah? So this is a village, you see some constructions here, some trees, yeah? And look at the scale. So it is absolutely impressive. It is absolutely impressive. And if you read this again, it's okay, we are looking at the sink line. That's okay, we are learning structural geology, but our purpose is to understand what happened with the continental masses. So it says, this is one expression of the tectonic shortening, yeah, from the collision of the Indian Australian plate and the Eurasian plate. That's why we have the Himalayas. We will talk about the Himalayas in the second part of the course, but I'm just trying to encourage you to see beyond you know, all these details that we are discussing, yeah? So very, very um, impressive. So it says that the folding, you see this folding, uh, was achieved through flexural slip along bedding. So we will learn that flexural slip means kind of slip at the interfaces of these layers to accommodate, to accommodate this shortening, yeah? Um, and um, you see the core, the core of the fold, which actually is uh, the ridge line, yeah, is the highest part here. All right, so very, very uh, nice picture, I would say. This is from your textbook, yeah? It, it shows limestone that is folded and so on. So what we're doing in structural geology, we try to, to rationalize, yeah? To have a rational view at these folds because uh, a person who is not a geologist will say, wow, how beautiful. But we have to move beyond how beautiful and to be able technically to say things about uh, uh, the folds, yeah? So that's why we will start today discussing the geometric aspects of folds. And next time we'll discuss the processes of folding, yeah? That's the idea. Uh, one more picture to um, uh, have you enjoy something nice. This is from Greenland. So as you can see, we've been to Antarctica, we went to Tibet, and now we go uh, at the top of the world in the Northern Hemisphere 
and we go to Greenland. And what you see here, you see another fold, but there is a word here, it says the recumbent. And the recumbent means this fold that lies on its side, yeah? So um, another impressive thing here, I would say, if, if you read, is that this cliff, the basically the distance from the river here to the top is about 800 meters. So quite impressive, yeah? So uh, Greenland has these cliffs actually, um, and uh, geology in Greenland is done with the helicopter, otherwise it's vir virtually impossible. All right, so now that we know what we are talking about, yeah, let's, let's go and look at the geometric aspects of folds and, and rationalize and make sense of these things, yeah? So let's look at these things. We have some terms here, yeah? And the terms, if you look here, the easiest way, yeah? If, if you were asked, draw for the, uh, a baby, yeah? Like a three-year-old could put two lines like this, yeah? And then you can say, well, this is more or less something that represents a fold, a sketch. So we call the two sides limbs, yeah, limbs. And uh, the point, if we look in this cross section, yeah, uh, the point where they meet, we call it the hinge point. Now you can imagine this is just a cross section. If we have in 3D, we have a hinge line, yeah. Um, However, normally, when you look at, at, at these things here, yeah, these things, you see some curvature here, yeah? You see some curvature. You don't see just, you know, two lines coming like this in most cases. So we have something called a hinge zone, yeah? Where you have this uh, change uh, of curvature and here you have curvature zero, so, and, and it changes, yeah? But the hinge zone, you see, can be a bit different. You have a, a spectrum of hinge shapes, yeah? Uh, this is uh, a pointed one, yeah? Uh, and you can have a very, you know, rounded one, yeah? So, so the idea is that these ones, for instance, if you look here, these are called kink uh, bands, kink bands. And you can say, okay, this is something similar to this, yeah? We just have these two, uh, straight directions meeting. These type of folds are called chevron folds, yeah, chevron folds. So again, more or less something like this. But these are concentric folds, and you see why they call them concentric, yeah? You, you see it, this, very nice. Um, these ones, yeah, these ones, uh, for instance, called box folds, yeah? Yeah, the idea is that they are more complicated. You see two axial traces here, uh, and so on. Now, so in this slide, I wanted you to get familiar with these terms. You have them here, limbs, hinge point, hinge zone, yeah? And as if you study mathematics, this is an inflection point, yeah? An inflection point. So uh, you can imagine what happens here at the inflection point. It is uh, one curvature here, another curvature here, yeah? This is, uh, is concave up and this is convex up, yeah? That's the inflection point. All right, now, um, let's look at something a bit more complex. Now that we, we have this uh, terminology, if you remember, we looked in a cross section, yeah? And this was a cross section and you know about the hinge point already, you know about things and you know about the inflection point, yeah? So here are definitions, hinge point, maximum curvature, yeah, maximum. Um, the, now, they are connected, the hinge points, yeah, are connected by a hinge line, yeah? So you can take many cross sections, but this is a hinge line, all right? And if this line, if this line is straight, not curved like this, straight, then the fold is called cylindrical. And you can understand why, yeah? So it is called cylindrical. So this is a cylindrical fold, and this one is not, because the hinge line is curved. You see it here. 
Now, you can imagine, imagine that you have several layers, yeah, kappas here. Let's say we have some shale, some sandstone, some uh, uh, siltstone here, yeah, and they get folded. Imagine that you can look uh, at the hinge point here of this shale layer, the hinge point of this sandstone layer, the hinge point here of this siltstone layer, and you can connect them, yeah? You can connect them. So this, in this cross section is called axial trace, but the actual surface that is made out of all these hinge lines, yeah, as you go inside, yeah, is called axial surface, which makes sense, yeah, axial surface. Now the axial surface can be a surface, yeah, or it can be a plane, yeah? If it is a plane, it is a plane, but in other situations, uh, it is just a surface. So that's why I'm, I'm showing you this situation. Yeah. Uh, so this situation, you have an axial surface. You see how complicated it is. This is like a hinge line and you see it's not straight. So this is not a cylindrical fold. And guess what? In nature and in geology, yeah, in the geological reality, most of the situations are not cylindrical, yeah, are very complex and so on. Um, <laughs> here, you have an axial surface that is a plane, yeah, it is a plane, so it is an axial plane, but the hinge line, it's curved, as you can see, it's not a straight, so this is not a cylindrical fold. Here, the hinge line is straight, and you have an axial plane, so this is a cylindrical fold, yeah? So uh, I know it's, it might seem a lot to you, but when you look, I want you to look carefully at this, study this at home uh, after our class when you have time, and you'll see that they are not so complicated, that geometrically speaking, it may, makes sense that we try to, to have some names for all these parts. And here is another aspect I wanna show you. We can look at the fold as if it were a mathematical function, yeah? And we can say, well, this is the wavelength, yeah? Let's say you can have folds that kind of repeat, like a sinusoidal function, yeah? So this would be the wavelength, yeah? And the amplitude is taken as if this is the axis, yeah? The axis, uh, like the zero <laughs> axis, relative to it, you have the positive part and the negative part of a function, yeah? Imagine of a sinusoidal function. So this is the amplitude, yeah? Where you have the inflection points, all right? So keep in mind, I'm giving you all this terminology, not because I want to torture you, but because you will have to read geological texts and you will have to understand what the text refers to when they describe a fold. Yeah, so that's the reason. All right. Now, this is just a little example of a cylindrical fold here. At least this part was cylindrical. Now, it may happen, you can see, if it were to continue somewhere, the hinge line may no longer be straight, and then the fold is no longer cylindrical because they have to start somewhere and end somewhere. It cannot go to the infinite like this. All right. Now, take a deep breath. Yeah. Two seconds of uh, break. Uh, let's see. We have a uh, what I'm. We have here. So terminology, monocline. You see, only one limb is inclined. So, for instance, the limb here is horizontal, and the limb here is inclined. The limb here is horizontal. The limb here is inclined. Monoclinal fold. Okay. This is an antiform and this is a symform, yeah? So antiform, the limbs go deep down, yeah, away from the hinge. Symform, it's the opposite, yeah? The limbs go up and uh, they, the whole thing looks like a valley. Antiform and symform, we use these terms when we don't know, when we don't know the stratigraphy when we don't know if this is older and this is younger or the other way around. So if we don't know this and you talk to someone, technically speaking, but you don't know the stratigraphy, 
you say, okay, look at that antiform. Now, if you know the stratigraphy and you see a limestone layer and a shale layer, and you know that in that region, the stratigraphy, the, the limestone layer is uh, younger, the um, shale layer is older, then you can become more precise and you can say, this is an anticline, yeah? So an anticline, the rock layers are younger away from the axial surface. So this is the axial surface and away from it, as you go away from it, the, uh, the layers are younger. So that means this is younger than this. And then you call this an anticline, okay? Now, if this were to be folded the other way around, yeah, like a seam form here, and what happens, the layers get younger as you get closer to the axial surface. So the axial surface is here, yeah? So as you go closer to the axial surface, the layers get younger like this. So this is younger, this is older. We call this a sink line, okay. Now, again, another deep breath. What if it were the other way around? What if the, it looks like a sink line? Yeah. But actually the layers are not that this is younger and this is older, but this is older and this is younger. What if it's the, the reverse situation? It's this, yeah? So remember, this is younger, this is older, yeah? So how do you call this? According to the definition, the layers get younger as you get away from the axial surface. So the axial surface is here and you move away from it. This is older, this is younger. So as you go away from the axial surface, the layers are younger. You look at the definition and say, well, this is an anticline. Okay, but what type of anticline? It is a sinformal anticline because by definition, stratigraphically speaking, it is an anticline, but geometrically, it is a sinform. Yeah, so that's why you have to say sinformal anticline. Now, obviously, here we should have said antiformal anticline for instance, to be very precise, but no one does that because when you say it's just an anticline, everyone understands that you say, well, it is an anticline, it is antiformal as well, yeah? But if it's the other situation and the layers get younger away from the axial surface, then you have to say geometrically, it looks like a seam form, but stratigraphically, it is an anticline. And the other so way around. The difference yes. is the process. Uh, uh, yes, Gabriel. What, what's the question? So the difference is the process. For example, well, the, the process that led us. the actual deformation processes that led to the geometry that we see, because the, the geological layers can be overturned and so on. Definitely, of course. But let's say you have an outcrop. Now we, we discuss at the level of an outcrop and you, you see this, and then you have to have a way to refer to this, yeah? And then instead of someone writing, well, we have a structure that looks like a seam form and the layers get younger away from the axial surface. Oh, I already wrote a, a big sentence. A geologist will say, we have a seam form Atlantic line. Bye. Okay, so that's the idea. Then if we discuss, as you say, Gabriel, how we got to have a sinformal anticline, how that we have an overturned stratigraphic section, obviously that we, we are getting at a different scale, yeah? And we start discussing about regional geology and then tectonics. So I want you to take time when you have a bit of time and think about these things and they will make sense to you. So in the end, what Gabriel was pointing out is if we look at these pieces, because this is what we see in, in an outcrop, we use these things. But then when you see that, in fact, each of these pieces 
might be part, might be part of an actually, you had some layers that were co very complexly folded. So you had an initial fold that got put on its side and then the fold itself was folded, yeah? So imagine what can happen in geology. So in the end, you have such a complex situation, but you can see only parts of it, only parts of it, yeah? And then you say, well, I see only this, I have an anticline. I see only this, oh, it's a syncline. But if I were to see in the outcrop only this, antiformal syncline, yeah, for instance. So what I mean to say, you as future geologists will look at different outcrops and will try to reconstruct in the end the geometry, the complex geometry of a piece of land, yeah, and you may end up with something like this, and then you use your knowledge of tectonics and you will say, well, what happened that we ended up with this deformation? It's like in a car crash, yeah, the investigators looked at the way the cars were crumpled, yeah, and deformed to understand exactly what happened. All right, so that's what we are doing, but way complex, more complex than in car crash. Can you answer your question? Absolutely, yes. Uh, I don't know if it's only me, but I have like this understanding maybe from previous courses that always when I looked at the afloramientos and the topography and the altitudes of these ones, I always assume that the anticlinal uh, fold will be the highest one. But looking in the laboratory, some things that we have done, the anticlinal can always can also be in a lower Altitude yeah. cannot be presented in the same way like this. Like curve. Well, I'm not sure I understand what you mean, but but when you talk about an anticline, normally people think uh, about something like this, yes. which is actually an antiform. If you know the stratigraphy, you can say it's an anticline. But I just shown you that by definition, this is an anticline, but it has the geometry of a sinform because anticline, theoretically anticline, is just this definition that you see here. Rock layers get younger away from the axial surface. Yeah, that's the definition. But people, instead of saying here, anti-formal anticline, they just say anticline, and that's why it helps and it doesn't help, yeah? Because then you get attached too much to this image. But but I want to detach you from this image. I want to, you to think in terms of antiforms and sinforms. And if the stratigraphy uh, obeys the definition, then you call it an anticline. Yeah, okay. that's the idea. Okay. So that there's is. a difference between the form of these folds and the composition of the, of the folds? Composition? Uh, like you mean the, the stratigraphy? That young and mm -hmm. that... Sorry? Sorry. I mean, if the rock is young or old, or that's a difference between that yeah. and, the, and, the, so, and the form. Yeah, so the form is given by these terms, sin form, anti form, like a hill and a valley. That's a, the shape. Okay. The, uh, the rule of stratigraphy, which is relative to the axial plane. So the axial plane of the fold is here, yeah, in the center. The rule says, if you move away, as you move away from the axial plane to the ex exterior of the fold, the layer get younger or older. If they get younger, it's an anticline. If they get older, it's a syncline. These are definitions. So that's why I'm showing you this because I know from general geology, it's very simple to say, okay, this is an anticline, but it is an antiform. You have to know, as you say, the composition the stratigraphy, the, the order of the stratigraphy to be able to use the word anticline and syncline. All right? Let's okay, we can talk at the end. Let me finish the, the rest of the slides because maybe some of your colleagues want to go at the end of the class. And if you want, we can talk more at the end. Yes, thank you very much. No, no problem, David. So again, this is not for you to, to memorize. There are various people, various people who studied folds a lot and they offered uh, different classifications. So let's look at some of these classifications. This one, you see, it's like you look at these things and you look at your fold and you can say, well, this fold looks more like 
D4, yeah? So Huddleston in 1973 had this. So is, it, is the fold you are looking at like F3 or it's like C5, yeah? So a type of classification, for instance. Now, here, this is important. I want you to understand this classification because this classification, uh, the reason I want you to understand it is because it has this terminology that you will encounter in the literature, yeah? So I want you to start understanding this in this way. You have two axes here, yeah? This, ax, this axis shows the dip of axial surface. So axial surface is this surface here, like a plane, the blue plane here, yeah? So if it is vertical, this axial surface, we call the fold upright, yeah? Upright, between 80 degrees and 90 degrees, it's upright. Then you see, here it's steeply inclined, then it's moderately inclined, then it's gently inclined, then between zero and 10 degrees, like in Greenland, the image from Greenland, you see the fold was sitting on its side. So we call this recumbent. So the reason I want you to understand this classification is because I want you to understand this word. Uh, you will encounter it in the literature. That's why I want you to know it. Upright the same. So understand this. The other one on this axis, what happens of the hinge line? Hinge line is this one, yeah? This one. So the hinge line, is it horizontal or is it dipping or plunging? Yeah. So if it's horizontal, it's like this fold, upright and horizontal, yeah? This is gently plunging, you see, between 10 degrees and 30 degrees, moderately plunging more, steeply plunging down to vertical, yeah? So vertical. Now, a combination of this situation, like here, what happened? The axial surface is inclined. You can say moderately inclined. And the hinge line is plunging. So it's plunging inclined, for instance. <laughs> and this situation here, you can see it, it's called the reclined, okay? But don't worry about this as combinations. As you understand these axes and these axes, that's fine, fine enough, yeah? Because then you can imagine in your mind, it's moderately inclined, moderately plunging, yeah? then geometrically you can remember the combination of these two surfaces, yeah? That's the idea. Um, you see here from another textbook, from the other textbook of uh, uh, Prim, uh, how they gave this. But if I were to give you this, you would have to remember, okay, zero to 10, 10 to 30, okay, well, this, I think it's more interesting because it makes you visualize and geology is a 3D enterprise. All right, so pay attention to this one to understand it. Then our classifications that you will get, this, as you can see, uh, the angle between the two limbs. You can see something that we call isoclinal and then tight and then open and then gentle, yeah? Now, you see different offers have different boundaries. Like the uh, one textbook says zero to 30, another book zero to 10, because no one established them for, yeah, it's 10 or 30. So some people may say isoclinal if it's 20 degrees, uh, yeah, and other people might say it's tight. Well, we have to understand from the context. But uh, the reason I'm putting this is not to confuse you, but just to show you that this is a reality. Okay, but understand, the the transition from isoclinal tight open gentle yeah that's the idea this is we might seem complicated is just for you to know that it exists one guy a british geologist called ramsey he decided to classify uh, folds in a very sophisticated way by using something that he calls deep isogons isogons are these blue lines and they link points on each side of the layer that was folded that have the same inclination, the same dip, yeah? So the angle of the tangent here and the angle of the tangent here is the same. And for this one, it's the same here, the same. So the two points have 
uh, are basically points with the same dip on the two surfaces of the layer that is folded. The, he, this is called a deep isogon. So he looks at these deep isogons and you see here his classification, class one, deep isogons converge toward the inner arc. So you see all of them converge towards the inner arc here. They all converge, yeah? Class two called also similar folds or shear folds. Deep isogons are parallel to the axial trace. So you see, they are all parallel to the axial trace here, okay? And class three, guess what? They basically diverge, yeah, um, uh, toward the inner arc, yeah? So class one, class two, class three, using deep isogons. He even divided this into three subclasses, yeah? One A, B, C. And it's explained here what it is. Again, I you don't have to remember, but, just to know when you read something in using that uses this classification to know where to go to remember what is it and he was very sophisticated so you know the local dip of the layer let's say the dip at this point and he calculated this parameter you see by taking these two segments yeah the thickness here and the thickness here and using these two created this field where he separated the various classes, yeah? And you can see class two goes along this line, class three is in this field, and class one is in this field. Again, you don't have to remember now, I'm not gonna ask you, draw me out of the blue, uh, class one, B, fold, and so on. It's just for you to be aware, be aware about these things, okay? So, uh, just two more slides and I'll be done. Please be uh, have a bit of patience with me. So symmetric folds like this one, it's a symmetric fold, for instance, yeah? Why? Um, or this one, this big one, it's a symmetric fold. If you put, take the axial plane here, what is on the left is also on the right. It's like a mirror that's symmetric, yeah? When you see them like this, they are called like M folds. You see the M here, see the M. So the symmetric folds are sometimes called M folds. Now we have asymmetric folds. These are asymmetric folds. Look at the limbs. Yeah, one limb is uh, more developed than the other. And these asymmetric folds can be S folds or Z folds. Let's see why. If you look at this on this side, you see the letter Z here, and this is Z. So this, that's why they are called Z folds. If you look on the other side, it's like you ha have the letter S, yeah? You see S, so S folds. Now, if you were to go on the other side of the fold and look uh, from the other side, now this would be the Z folds and this would be the, the S folds. So it's a relative, it's when you describe what you see in an outcrop and you see, I'm seeing S folds on these sides and so on, yeah? That's the idea. Now, another uh, term I want you to learn is that this is like a first order fold, this big one, yeah? And then on top of it, yeah? The large fold, the big one, on top of it has smaller folds. Yeah, smaller folds. They are called parasitic folds, like parasites. Yeah, they are, they ride on top of the big fold. Yeah, so new terminology for you, but not very difficult. I think it's kind of clear what what is meant. And uh, you can have fold systems. Let's say this is a situation, but th this whole thing is recumbent, and you have an outcrop, and in the outcrop or several outcrops, you see only this section here. Yeah, this section, but it's horizontal, yeah, like this. So you'll see a succession of folds that look like this, yeah, here. And this is called vergence, yeah, the constant, the direction of asymmetry here. So this is like, you see here, it looks like an, a Z fold, yeah, it's like the letter Z, but it has a vergence. So in geology, you'll see, you'll say, well, we have um, 
a fault system. I can see here in that area, I went and I saw a fault system with, with a vergence uh, towards west or towards south. So people understand, that's why we, we use these words, what you are describing, okay? Now, how do you get them? This is a final slide, don't get scared. You remember the coaxial deformation and the strain ellipse, yeah? This is a strain ellipse, in 3D is an ellipsoid. So imagine a big volume of rock, yeah? Imagine a big volume of rock and imagine, imagine, <laughs> that this big volume of rock suffers yeah, uh, deformation like this, coaxial deformation, that can be described by this ellipse of deformation. Yeah? So in this blue field is the field of shortening. Yeah? So the material in there will suffer shortening. In the white fields, the material will suffer extension yeah, in this volume of rock. So if you have let's say geologically speaking some layers that because of previous tectonic uh, situations are kind of vertical here if one layer is right here now you will shorten it yeah you will shorten it and you will create these symmetric folds here right here but if the layer were kind of dipping like this will suffer shortening and will create this asymmetric folds, which would be Z folds, as you can see, if the layer were like this, or if the layer were like this, then this whole volume being uh, su suffering deformation, this layer would suffer shortening, of course, and will create, will accommodate the shortening by creating these asymmetric folds, which look like S folds here, yeah? So, you can see why we learned about this kind of abstract things and so on, because we have to go in the field, we have to look at what the field shows us. And in order to understand the history of the formation, now it starts making sense. We kind of try to realize in which part these layers were because they suffered this type of deformation, was symmetric, was asymmetric and so on. Now, these are buddhans. So you, you see, you might have a, an, a, a layer that is competent. So it suffers extension by breaking. And in between the, the uh, material that can flow, you would have folds being formed in between the buddhans here as well. You can see these ones here. So what Fawson tries to say here is that the fold asymmetry may relate to different things can be positioned on a lower order fold, yeah? So fold asymmetry may relate to the fact that these folds are parasitic on top of a bigger fold, or could be the sense of shear or orientation of the folded layer relative to the strain ellipse, yeah? So we have different situations, but we are trying as human beings to be rational and to try to understand what is happening and our tools are stress and the strain yeah we, that's why we use these concepts so that we can use them as tools to understand the history of the formation so this is it for today this is a, a reading for this part of the uh, uh, chapter on folds now if you have questions if daniel if you want to discuss more about that i'm more than welcome to stay here with you and uh, whoever wants to participate. If not, fairly started to all of you. Yeah. So thank you very much to, to all. I'm going to stop the content right now and I'll put it back if anyone wants to talk more. All right. So gracias a todos. You are welcome, uh, Juan Daniel. Um, so see you on Tuesday. Good, and a good weekend. <laughs> You're welcome. All of you are welcome. Yeah. Gabriel, any question? Valentina? <laughs> no teacher, thank you. All right, Gabriel. You are welcome, Valentina. Welcome, Gabriel. Bye. Bye.